Ready for some cookie takes on Snap Judgments? Brought to you by Byers Auto. Jeremy Birmingham has got you covered. I bet Bill Andis has some thoughts too. So do I. But none of us asked Carlos Lachlan about cookies in a press conference. So what did we learn? I don't think that he... Well, he said he doesn't eat cookies. So a lot of his <laughs> cookie takes at this point, I think, suspect. are kind of yeah. suspect at, at best. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I'm sure we should really listen to him about the cookie stuff. Mm. But... Um, I, I think it's a, a good way to break the ice with someone who has a weird uh, cliche around their lifestyle. And I think it's good to just say, hey, man, soft batch cookies are actually the tastiest of of the, the Keebler type cookies, the store bought cookies. Um, You're yeah. a brave man to say that anything Carlos Lachlan does is weird or yeah. un- or yeah. cliche. It looks like you can rip your head off. I'm, I'm dumb enough <laughs> to say <laughs> anything to anyone. Um, but... Obviously, first impression of Carlos Lachlan is pretty good um, as far as who he is. I think that, uh, I mean, I really wanted to ask him, like, does this job feel bigger than what you've done before? And and his response was, no, I'm the same person. I'm going to do the exact same thing. And it doesn't matter what brand is on my chest. And, like, I mean, I kind of get it. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know that he's really firmly aware yet of exactly what the power of the Blocko brings around the country. And he'll find that out when they get out on the recruiting trail next month. Yeah, he's only one week of uh, residence in the Woody Hayes Athletic Center. So I he hasn't even, right, Berman, he's not even on the road. He's, yeah, can't be. So yeah, I think he'll probably feel a difference to that. But I don't, well, he may never admit it yeah. because uh, Coach Locke already believed he was one of the best recruiters, one of the best running backs coaches in the country, and that those doors were going to be open for him. He is... When we talk about new hires coming in and winning the press conference, um, they don't usually like intimidate the audience. Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. It's like it's normally almost almost scary when we're like, yeah, I'm saying, yeah, yeah. you better believe in me, yeah, or else. It's like normally it's like endearing themselves to the audience. In this instance, it was like, and he did afterwards. He did come and shake everyone's hand, but I think my fingers are broken. So yeah, he like also like like just like stares into your soul. When yeah, he, when he I I like it. I like no, it. No, I I like it too. Like he is extremely confident, and why would you not be when you've been on on field assistant for what three years and you're already at Ohio State, right? Like on one hand, it's like, are you ready for this? On the other hand, it's like people thought enough about you that you're kind of on this rocket ship to get to a place like Ohio State. So not not early in his coaching career, but early into being an on on field coach. So he's incredibly impressive. Um, he reiterated again today that he thinks running backs are the worst coach position uh, in football, and, and he totally has, agree. He, no, I, I mean I agree too. I think I mean, we talked about it, right? Like we've we've as oh, I said, was going through this process. We alluded to the idea that like conventional wisdom is it is the easiest position probably to coach, but I don't think that means Carlos Lachlan is going to just coast here. It seems like quite the opposite. I really like. Sorry, before yeah. you ju- jump ahead, like one thing that Brian Hartline said a couple of years ago over and over again is I'm not, I'm not a recruiter. I'm not a great recruiter. James Laurinaitis has taken on that same tack. I don't want to recruit kids. I want to build something real. And I, I like the fact that he said, I'm not a great recruiter. And I also love the fact that he said, I'm an elite relationship builder. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, damn, this guy believes in himself. And uh, you have to ha- like, you don't get on that rocket ship yeah. to get to Ohio state in three years to be Oregon's uh, on-field running backs coach after one year of coaching the position, unless you have that confidence, but you can really tell like that, that guy exudes that confidence and sometimes maybe might border and cocky and that's okay too. I don't, I don't, I don't really understand why being called a good recruiter got a negative connotation in the minds of some people because it, I think they feel it undermines their coaching ability. And I think it, it's, makes well, you can be both. That, We're not saying, yeah, sure, for sure. I, I think there are a lot of people who fair or unfair, um, line up recruiting with sales. And I don't think anyone wants to be viewed as a salesman in, in that job. James Franklin. Well, yeah. who else is going to buy all the snake oil? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to hawk it. Anyway, uh, Carl Slockland, great conversation. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. We'll have more uh, coverage on that and the running backs, of course, because that room is also in a bit of flux uh, with Dallin Hayden heading for the exit. Ryan Day didn't want to talk about that decision specifically, said they would wait until the transfer portal actually opens, which I think is certainly fair. Um, But there are a lot of other things to learn from Ryan Day that were not running back specific. So, Bill, let me, oh gosh, could you start? Could you find something that you could take away about the offensive line conversation? Nope. 
this was actually, I think, the most insight we've gotten into the office. <laughs> it was quite line, a lot. It was quite um, a lot. All, all spring. And like I don't I feel like I have some clarity. Like I don't start with like Josh Fryer, right? Like Josh Fryer is going to start on this offensive line. Probably a tackle. But potentially a guard, like, but like that. Now the guard has been ex- guard battle has been expanded to include like Josh Fryer, Luke Montgomery, Tegra Shabola, uh, Carson Hinsman, Seth, Seth McLaughlin. So that's everybody, right? Yep. So it's like like five guys who could potentially play guard on this team. The thing maybe that I thought was most interesting was like I asked Ryan Day, or I, you know, I said to him what we talked about on the show on on Wednesday morning. You expressed confidence coming into spring ball that you had the answers in house. Do you still feel that way? And like he didn't say no. But he didn't like emphatically say yes either, and I, and I get not wanting to paint yourself into a corner if Ohio State does decide to go into the transfer portal, and like I don't know who that could be. It could very well end up that no one worth going after is in the transfer portal if Ohio State is looking for an offensive lineman. But but I think at least my view on it, you guys can tell me if you disagree, is like one of the two guys is going to be the starting center. We know the left side of the line. Josh Fryer is going to start, and if they see an upgrade, either at guard or tackle can play on the right side like they might go after that guy now and i wasn't so sure of that but i kind of feel like they will provided the caliber of player actually exists i i mean i agree that he left the door open for that certainly i think the thing that i'm most interested in figuring out and hopefully we can maybe get a chance to figure that out before saturday and if we do we'll certainly talk about it but i wonder if the recent decision to kind of fiddle around with josh fryer back at right guard is an indicator that Tegra Shabola and his elite athleticism mm-hmm. has finally started to pop. Yeah, a little bit. Yep. Or if it means that Luke Montgomery has fallen into a bit of a sophomore slump at the end of spring, because I think it has to be one of those two things, I'd be, imagine. I do think there's a both. world where it's yeah. both. Yeah, I mean, it could be both, but uh, because I don't think you start like tinkering with this at this point unless something is happening that is causing you to have to do it, because I. It seemed like for the first seven, eight practices, like the idea was pretty set. Like, Fryer's going to be at right tackle and Montgomery's going to be yep. next to him. Mm-hmm. And then what's happened in the last two weeks, I guess, is anyone's uh, guess. But it feels like something has transpired. And that then opens up the door, as you're saying, for, to at least look at who enters the transfer portal. Yeah, I think when we, when Bill and I both interjected there that it could be both things, it seems to me like it is probably. Probably, I do not know. More related to Luke Montgomery and the physical comparison. Bill and I also talked about that on the the podcast daily earlier on Wednesday morning. Like looking at Seth McLaughlin and the development of Carson Hensman and the confidence that they have in Josh Fryer in some form or fashion. It is probably easier in Ohio State's mind to move one of those centers to guard if Luke Montgomery is taking a slight step back. And I, I there's a there's yeah. so much time. Yeah. I don't know that that's happened. And I don't know that it would continue because there's still months ahead of this for Luke Montgomery to enhance his body and get more comfortable. He's been here for 14 months. Like It's not a sign that Ohio State is panicked about the offensive line, giving up on Luke Montgomery. It is they have more flexibility and versatility, I think, with this group counting center out to the right tackle than they had a year ago. Mm -hmm. And they have not had an offensive line that we could consider a truly elite Joe Moore award-winning caliber unit. Even when you had Paris Johnson and Dewan Jones and that group was very good, it felt disjointed at times because there were too many tackles on the field. They were playing in the wrong spot. I think Ohio State has got to this point where they have the option to look at other people and they know that they've not maybe got it five out of five for several years in a row. Yeah, I think think at the moment, they are much better positioned to find in-house answers than they were at this point last year. And if I had to guess right now, I, I would probably guess that the starting five offensive linemen in the fall are already on this roster. Because I do think that, you know, I think Tegra has gotten better and Carson Hinsman, I think, is, is better off for having gone through some struggles this year. Seth McLaughlin is obviously very experienced. And I, like, I'm not writing off Luke Montgomery because like he's a sophomore who's going through spring practice as like a starter for the first time and maybe you start to tell off a little bit at the end of spring ball i I almost think that's expected um so like i i very much think they can find the answer here but i i also view it like i would any other position like if you're ohio state and someone is in the transfer portal who is just an upgrade like is definitely better than anything you have then you have to explore that option but it doesn't mean that they they will or that that guy will will be there available to them but i I just like it's more well, the fluid, I guess, maybe, than I would have expected. But I, I don't think it's like a 
panic yeah. situation. So I guess we'll find out because like last year in the second portal window, Josh Simmons was almost certainly the best thing available. Mm -hmm. In this bizarre new era, even one year later with the transfer portal, we had no idea what could be available. Yeah. Josh Simmons had been available in the earlier. He just didn't transfer yeah. until the end. So it wasn't like they found someone in a, in April. They added him at that point, but the conversation had been, and the evaluation had been going on for a few months. Plus, he was a guy that Justin Fry had recruited uh, on, on the West Coast. Yeah. When we talked to Luke Montgomery a week ago, he said, like, it, he, he, people kept asking him, are you the starter? He said, I'm just trying to get through one day at a time. Like, he was not a kid at that point who was – puffing out his chest and saying, this is my spot. I'm not going to lose it. Like he understood, I think at that moment that there were things still in flux and, and clearly what we are now talking about is just a sign of that. And, and they're all understanding it again. Luke Montgomery didn't have the uh, ability to go through a rough patch a year ago, like Carson Inman did. And as you said, he's probably much better off for that. So you need to grow and, and get through it. Like as long as you know that you're not going to quit, which is the goal here for, for coaches to see if you will after your freshman year. Like Luke Montgomery will be fine, but if you're talking about where things go for this fall, there are questions that you still have to answer. All right. Did you get anything else answered that was on your mind, Brian? I mean, I felt like a Julian Sayan press conference with a number of questions that were asked about him after losing his black stripe. Uh, well, Monday. getting your black stripe removed after nine, ten practices yeah, as I mean, a true freshman is a way of making that happen. It's pretty impressive. It almost felt like ryan day was just walking up right to the line and saying he's qb3 right now I, kind of that way too. I don't know that he wanted to go that far with it and especially again because number one none of us believe or really had any expectation that all five of these scholarship quarterbacks will stay on this roster after spring ball but i i, I do think that if julian saying is taking that track to qb3 and potentially beyond that, because Ryan Day was gushing about the kid almost in a C.J. Stroud type of way, um, that maybe that answers some other questions uh, in, in that room, because it seems pretty clear to me that Julian Sayan has elevated. And Ryan Day did not poo-poo the idea of him being in the mix as the starter, which he actually said he's in the mix. So yep. it's not even that he was pushing back against the idea. He's the one that floated it. So that is unexpected. Uh, I still think there's a long way to go before Julian Sane would be really in that conversation for um, game one or game four or game six. But it, the fact that he's in that conversation after nine practices, uh, you know, getting the black stripe removed when he did, like that is very impressive. And you cannot say, people are going to be concerned about the size, but like no one complained about Drew, Drew Brees and how big he was, right? Like if you can throw the football in well, rhythm and I don't on, know that that's on location then it's fine. I don't know that that's fair because he also, Rende, made a number of references to how much the quarterback is going to run the football. So yeah. I do think size for Julian Sain is going to be an important yeah. part of I this mean, conversation. I think that's why he was saying he, this, these are things he has to still get there to get to the level and really get to the level where Devin Brown and Will Howard are. But like that could change next year. The whole point is like maybe you don't need to run the ball as much next year as you do this year because you will have a quarterback like – yeah, CJ Stroud or Drew Brees or that type of passer who no pressure. No pressure. Yeah. I'm saying, I mean, we, <laughs> no, he can spin it. You know, you're right. That's, that's but I think that Drew Brees is the comparison you're looking for. A kid who's just about six one and a half, maybe six two. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to say what like because he like everyone else in that room is like a big dude. Yeah. So it's like he looks very little at times, but, but I he's not he's like, like little like, as a normal human. He's being. only Bryce Young. Yeah. 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 Uh, so regular listeners and watchers of the podcast will know that. Last week or for the last two weeks, I've sort of been like at least opening the door that all five guys could return in the fall. Um, close it for you. But we can, <laughs> I think, if if this is correct, which we all left Wednesday's press conference thinking, well, that was a really lot of Julian saying a whole lot of it, then that changes the conversation. I did not anticipate it getting to that level that quickly with him, if I'm being fully candid about that. I... What we've seen, he looks like the best pure passer of that group. That alone, I didn't think was going to be enough to change Ohio State's pecking order. And for the top two spots, I definitely still don't think that it will. But that does change the dynamic for Lincoln Keenholz and for Air Nolan pretty significantly. Yeah, I mean, definitely for Lincoln Keenholz. And like Air's, Air's situation changed the moment that Ohio State decided to take Julian Sain. But, you know, I, I also see value in like sticking it out and, and 
trying to get better at competing for that job is going to be available in, in 2025 too. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. But yeah, it's, it's different. Um, and it's felt like there's been like some momentum going this way. And I was kind of curious how Ryan Day might handle it. And he didn't try to water it down at all. So I, I, I think that we are, I, I don't know, prob- probably there already where I think that Julian Sane is, is viewed as like the third guy in the room. And depending on how things shake out, he could very well be QB2 by the time the season. And I thought what was most interesting about it is that he reiterated and said it multiple times. The players know. The players see it. The yeah, players no, what's the point you can't hide yeah. what the guys on the team see and feel. So if that's their urging, if it's their push to say, hey, we, this guy is different then that forces the coaches in a way to make some decisions that I don't think that they really believe they would have to Mm -hmm. three weeks ago and maybe don't want to, but this is where you're at. Well, the world's going to get a peek at that on Saturday at noon in the horseshoe as Ohio State has their spring game. We're just a couple days away. We'll also be back uh, on Friday for an open practice, so we'll get a couple glimpses at Julian Sane and the rest of Ohio State's roster and the quarterbacks as spring camp winds down. Thanks for joining us on Snap Judgments. They are, as always, brought to you by Byers Auto. That's Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham. I'm Austin Ward. We'll talk to you again tomorrow on The Daily.